In this time, Myron Waldman took the reins as key animator, and David Tendler, Roland Crandall, and Seymour Nitel also made numerous notable contributions. The character that Betty had become drew enormously from the countercultural flapper girls of the Roaring Twenties, free-spirited women who could be found flaunting the rules of society at divey jazz clubs, publicly dressing scantily, dancing erratically, drinking and smoking excessively, and otherwise wildly enjoying the new radical freedoms of post-World War I society. Moulton called Betty the perfect flapper who could flirt and tease but remain pure and innocent, represented in her power paradoxical design, risque escapades, and overall titillating and sexually charged nature. She was garbed in a typical flapper dress, complete with revealing décotage and ever-falling garter, and was given an entire repertoire of racy songs and dances. This was by far the main allure for her cartoons and her as a character. Moulton further noted it was this pure novelty that kept her afloat. In fact, while most cartoons of the day drew a large child audience, the Fleischer's cartoons were mainly aimed at adult viewers, commonly attributed as to why she never quite reached the same level of stardom or longevity as Mickey Mouse. During a pre-code era where film censorship was extremely loose and almost non-existent, it was incredibly common for films to feature overtly explicit subject matter, including sexual themes and innuendo, promiscuity, infidelity, profanity, substance abuse, and even nudity. However, nothing of the sort had been seen in cartoons before, with the Flashes using Betty as somewhat of a conduit for the audience's darkly rooted desires. Just as strong female characters were a staple of pre-code cinema, Betty was the strongest of animated heroines. Not only was she the first sex symbol of animation, she could likewise be seen as one of the earliest feminist icons. A virginal character so free in unashamedly flaunting her sexuality, but fully aware of her own personal worth. While Betty relished in the attention thrown at her by her many male admirers, there was always a line, standing up for herself whenever it got out of hand. A number of shorts actually saw Betty in the clutches of sexual predators, whom she tenaciously struck back at. These shorts marked the earliest depictions of sexual harassment in animation, yeah. tackling the taboo head-on. Natwick attributed the instantaneous success of Betty to her being the first real feminine character, who introduced new sensitivity to cartoons. As, in Moulton's words, a holdover from the 1920s, Betty not only excited audiences in whole new ways, but for a brief spark in time, also provided an escapism from the dire existence of the Great Depression. Returning yeah. audiences to the glorious days of the Jazz Age by epitomising the hopes and dreams they so greatly desired. There was one, however, who was not all too thrilled with Betty's success. That was, of course, the woman who had inspired her very existence to begin with, Helen Kane. Oh. Known as the Boop Oopa Doop Girl, Kane saw an incredibly successful career throughout the 1920s as a star of songs, stage and screen, starring in seven pictures for Paramount between 1929 and 1931, including the exuberant musical review feature Paramount on Parade. As she found her own fame waning in the early 1930s, Kane was not impressed that Betty had simultaneously risen in popularity with essentially the same shtick. Feeling her limelight had been stolen and her image exploited, in 1932, Kane filed a $250,000 infringement lawsuit, equivalent of about $4.5 million in 2020, against Max Fleischer and Paramount for creating unfair competition with their deliberate caricature. Despite the fact that Betty Betty Boop had quite obviously drawn major influence from Kane's signature performance style. The problem for Kane was the defense was able to prove that it was not even hers to begin with. Esther Jones, a young African-American performer, was the one who laid claim to the style. Jones was an admired staple at Harlem's Cotton Club, a nightclub which regularly featured the most popular black entertainers of the time. Jones, nicknamed Baby Esther, was well known for her baby style of improvisational scat singing, all marked by youthful phrases like boo-boo-boo and doo-doo-doo. In court, Esther's theatrical manager, Lou Bolton, claimed that he had met Kane and her booking agent, Tony 
Tony Shane, also Jones's booking agent, at the Everglades Club on Broadway on an evening where Jones performed her signature act. Bolton asserted that Kane soon appropriated Jones's style, incorporating the phrase boop boop a doop into her song I Wanna Be Loved By You, which became a hit mere months later. Bolton also presented a filmed performance of Jones and the court ruled in favour of Paramount and Fleischer. It's fairly unreasonable to believe that the Fleischers or Paramount disregarded the influence of Jones as they were simply parodying a style that was rampantly popular at the time, with other actresses having also adopted it throughout their career, such as Paramount's It Girl of the 1920s, the iconic Clara Bow, a screen siren who starred in almost 60 films between 1922 and 1933, including 1927's Wings, the first ever Academy Award winner for Best Picture. Marilyn Monroe would later appropriate the style as well, most notably in 1959 classic Some Like It Hot. Whether her influence was direct or indirect, as jazz historian Robert O'Mealy has said, Jones is inarguably the black grandmother of Betty Boop. Today.